Now, if you have a, a copy of Brother Layton's book, Journey to Hope, available on Amazon, uh, then, then you can follow along. Uh, we're in chapter 10 this morning, uh, and this, uh, this chapter, chapter 10, he's titled it, Going Out on a Limb. Now, if you don't have the book, which is fine, you can get the most important thing out of your own Bible, and chances are you've got one either in your hand or on your device or something like that, and we'll start in Luke chapter 19 this morning. Uh, I've got my uh, old New International Version from 1984, and I'll be reading verses 1 through 10 of Luke chapter 19 this morning. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He's going to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man, too, is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. Did anybody ever ask you, what do you want to be when you grow up? It's a pretty common question. I imagine each one of us has been asked that. Some of us may have been asked that fairly recently. No matter that we may have salt and pepper in our hair, we, we've been asked that question occasionally, and it's a pretty common one. Now, where I grew up, out in uh, the oily business of West Texas, most of the guys who I knew said they wanted to be a quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys, just like Roger Staubach. Most of the girls who I knew wanted to be Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders, Now, there are more normal answers that you would get in normal communities, like uh, the helping professions, pretty popular, a police officer, a fireman, a nurse, or a doctor. Some kids might answer um, that they want to do what their parent did, or, or a grandparent, or some other beloved adult, uncle or aunt, or, or some other adult that they knew. But I never heard any child say that they wanted to grow up to be a tax collector. Maybe you have, but I hadn't. Now, Zacchaeus, who's the subject of this lesson, was probably no different. I doubt it was his childhood aspiration to become a tax collector. But that's where he finds himself. That's his profession whenever he encountered Jesus here in Luke 19. The title of the chapter in Brother Layton's book, The Going Out on a Limb, is literally true for Zacchaeus because he had to climb up a tree and hang on to its limbs in order to see Jesus. Now, we're familiar with the phrase going out on a limb by its figurative meaning, not its literal meaning. Somebody does something that they believe in even though it's risky or it might result in their ridicule. The story of Zacchaeus sheds light on our journey from hope sparked to there we go. Hope sparked to hope sensed to hope seen. So let's dig in this morning. True, but we're going to see a maybe a different side of Zacchaeus this morning. I hope we do. And I hope that if that that story of Zacchaeus from your, your childhood gave you the impression of Zacchaeus as some uh diminutive figure, not literally, but figuratively, you'll change your mind about who Zacchaeus is. By the time we, we get through the arrogance of our familiarity, um, and we'll, we'll see the story of, of who Zacchaeus 
was before he came to Jesus and who he became when he came in contact with Jesus. And there are several things that are left out of the song that I think are critical to our understanding of how Zacchaeus' journey to hope is a great case study, one of the seven case studies that Brother Layton put in his book. Um, Zacchaeus was a tax collector. This critical element is included here, but not how much tax collectors were hated. It's not specified. It's also not in the song at all. The job was considered, the job of tax collector, that is, was considered by Jewish society to be one of the worst of the worst jobs. If the pig herders from last week had been Jews, and we don't know for sure, but they might have been Jews, if they were Jews, that would be a terrible profession to have as a Jew because pigs were such horrible, unclean animals. A Jewish dog catcher might be in the same, same status if they had Jewish dog catchers. I don't know. But maybe worse was the Jewish tax collector. Now, now here's, why, here's why. Sure, they were hated because they frequently charged more than what was required and they put the difference in their pocket. That's how they got wealthy. But, but what made it even worse than the fact that they were dishonest or the frequency of their dishonesty was that they were fellow Jews who were suffering under the same Roman rule, yet they worked for the Romans, making the Romans rich through their expropriation, that is, taking resources from inside the community that were intended to enrich members of the community, but instead shipping those resources across the Aegean Sea to strengthen the very empire that they longed to overthrow. My fellow Jew, stealing from me to make himself rich, that's a problem. But a Jew stealing from me to make the emperor rich, that's disgusting. Even worse than being around unclean pigs all day, if you ask me. Now, not all tax collectors were the same. And we know this is the case because not all human beings are the same. Some tax collectors were probably more scrupulous than others. We know the Apostle Matthew was a tax collector, and maybe he was one of the good ones. We don't know his habits as a tax collector. Scripture doesn't tell us. But maybe his tax collection booth only collected the right amount of taxes. And maybe he only collected taxes from caravans passing through instead of from his neighbors. We don't know. But we do know that some tax collectors had specific jobs, like toll booth operator, if that kind of is what Matthew was. Some tax collectors were poll taxes. That is, if you're, if you're drawing breath, you got to pay the tax. Others were import or export tax collectors. There were land use tax collectors and so on, many different kinds of taxes levied by the Romans. Other folks were chief tax collectors, Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector, and he was the boss of a group of tax collectors. Secular history suggests that, that some of these chief tax collectors were regional bosses. So they might have supervised chief tax collectors in the different cities. So maybe a small little village might just have a tax collector who collected all the taxes. Some cities might have been bigger. You might have had different districts than regional uh, that's what secular history describes as these regional bosses. Uh, some chief tax collectors may have supervised um, specialists in collecting taxes. Like, for example, you could have a, a chief tax collector for agriculture. In a fertile area, a lot of crops were grown. This chief tax collector would be the boss of the expert in collecting the olive tax and then an expert in collecting the wheat tax, and an expert in collecting the grape tax, or whatever other crops were grown. And then there would be a boss over them to make sure they were doing their jobs well and to funnel the money up and then over to Rome. But whether they were the toll booth operators, or whether they were the boss, tax collectors of any type were hated. First, because they were assumed to be dishonest, and then because they worked for the hated Romans. Now maybe Matthew was an honest tax collector. We don't know. But it seems to me that Zacchaeus sort of admits to dishonesty in our story. We'll get into that a little later. But you've already heard it. 
In summary, about this whole tax collecting stuff, Zacchaeus was a despised representative of Rome. He was a dishonest cheat, and he was a betrayer of his fellow Jews. Plus, he was the boss of other tax collectors who were just as bad as he was, or maybe even worse. How bad were they? Well, when we see tax collectors in the Gospels, we see them as despised by the Jews. We see them counted as among the worst in society. Indeed, the term tax collectors and sinners lumps those communities together eight times in most translations of the Gospels. Jesus himself even echoed this in Matthew 18, 17. The tax collectors were to be treated as Gentiles, outsiders to the community of faith, in this case, the Jewish community, as Jesus was speaking. Now, this doesn't mean that Jesus detested outsiders. He didn't hate Gentiles. He didn't hate tax collectors. He didn't even hate sinners. Hating outsiders, however, was a popular attitude held by the people who populated the region where Jesus taught, Judea and around there. By contrasting his perspective in contrast with the, the people's perspective, Jesus emphasized the power of forgiveness to someone who's wronged you. And Jesus used tax collectors as an example of how his followers should show mercy and forgiveness instead. This was a shocking position to take. Kind of like in the Luke 10 parable of the Good Samaritan, where the Samaritan is the one who showed mercy when the priest and the Levite did not. Back to our story in Luke chapter 19. It's likely, or it seems likely to me anyway, that the Bible records only a fragment of the conversation between Jesus and Zacchaeus. There's just six sentences in the New International Version, and the story is only recorded in this gospel, in Luke's gospel. <clears throat> now, it would be truly remarkable, in my opinion, to spend the day with Jesus and only have these few words spoken. But whatever else they talked about, what's recorded is that Zacchaeus was moved to make a remarkable transformation. He promised to give half of his possessions to the poor. Now, this is an amazing response of faith. He was moved with the joy of salvation. Verse 9, salvation has come to this house today, Jesus writes. Moved with joy, Zacchaeus gives half of everything he owns. But that's not all. Like all tax collectors, Zacchaeus had to keep detailed records. He promised to review those records and pay back four times anyone he cheated. Now, maybe Zacchaeus was this rare, honest tax collector, and he knew there was no dishonesty in his records. But it's more likely, to me anyway, that he was fully committed to get right. And he was fully committed to comply with the Old Testament principle about paying back more than what was stolen. Now, Exodus 22, verse 1 says, A thief pays back four sheep for every stolen sheep. Uh, so there's a precedent for the number four. But without getting wrapped around the axle about the multiplier, because there's also scriptures that talk about two times and ones that talk about five times and ones that talk about seven times. But don't get wrapped around the number. The fact is, Zacchaeus repented of his sins and committed to faithful action. And Jesus blessed Zacchaeus for this commitment. Now there's some backstory to this story about Zacchaeus as well. And it has to do with the concept of tax collectors and sinners. <clears throat> if you were to go four chapters earlier in the book of Luke, chapter 15, it says, Tax collectors and sinners were coming to Jesus to hear him. And there were also self-righteous Pharisees and teachers of the law who were present. And just like here in Luke 19 and Luke 15, the Pharisees and teachers of the law were grumbling from the crowd that Jesus was hanging out with these nasty sinners. Same grumbling here in 19 when Jesus called a Zacchaeus up in the tree. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law didn't seem to want to help people or to change people. They were more about wagging their heads in judgment, complaining about how bad things were, and in that way pushing people further away 
from the teachings of the law that point to the coming hope and to the way people had to change on the inside instead of just changing on the outside. It's the old idea of circumcision in the flesh giving way to the old but made new idea of circumcision of the heart. The thing is, if we, if we think about Old Testament folks as, you know, they only needed to please God in an outward way. They only needed to show God their, their um, belief in Him or their obedience to Him through outside acts. Then we miss who God has always been. God has always wanted mankind's heart. And the parables of the lost sheep and the lost coin and the lost son, or the prodigal son, in Luke chapter 15, help make it clear. <clears throat> Let's move on, though, to the more recent history of Zacchaeus' story in Luke's gospel. So that was Luke 15. That's ancient history compared to Luke 19. Let's go just one chapter before, Luke chapter 18. One chapter, just one chapter before Zacchaeus. Jesus tells a parable of a Pharisee who went to the temple to pray. And boy, was he proud of himself, wasn't he? Now, he contrasts that with a tax collector who went to pray and was humble. Wouldn't even lift his head up. Beat himself on the chest. Jesus tells the crowd there, that the penitent and humble tax collector was justified before God, not the arrogant Pharisee. And Luke says the reason Jesus told this story was because some of the folks following him were confident in their own righteousness, and they looked down on everyone else. Now, the latter part, the looking down, it's easy for us to agree that's a bad thing. We should never look down on folks. It's true. We all have sinned and fallen short of the, the glory of God. But I think there's room for a conversation about being confident. And if you've been paying attention to the hope seen part of the journey to faith, <clears throat> Dave and I have been saying that Christians should mature into feeling confident of their salvation. So the problem is that these folks, the folks that Jesus is condemning, particularly as this Pharisee, by example, in chapter 18, the problem is this Pharisee was confident in his own righteousness. The mature Christian, on the other hand, the, the Christian who's moved to the hope seen part of their journey to faith, is not confident in their own righteousness, but they're confident in Jesus' righteousness. Now, I've got, I've got a, a couple of elders. I took my glasses. I don't see how many elders are over on this side, but I know there's two over here. So I'm going to mention a concept called imputed righteousness. And it's a theological concept, and there are some problems with the theological concept of imputed righteousness. But in essence, the idea of Jesus' righteousness rests in me. People who believe in Jesus put on Jesus. And in putting on Jesus, we put on Jesus' righteousness. So we are confident in Jesus' righteousness and not our own because His righteousness covers up, covers us, covers our sin. We don't engage in righteous words. We don't engage in righteous acts. And we don't engage in righteous thoughts in order to earn our salvation. It's impossible. There is nothing I can think or say or do that makes me righteous before God. However, we do and say and think things because of our hope in Christ's righteousness to cover us. And in obedience to Christ, in obedience to the gospel... We join a community of hope. Other people, just like us, who don't hope in our own righteousness, but instead hope in Christ's righteousness to cover us, to do what for us, to do for us what we could never do for ourselves. Again, it's not like God owes it to us because of what we've done. But this grace is a free gift through Christ. So we go through Luke 15 and we see the tax collectors and sinners there. 
<clears throat> then Luke 18, and we see the, the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector there. And we get to Luke 19 and Zacchaeus. <clears throat> Zacchaeus, as we begin the story, is just like every one of us at one time. We were all lost and dead without Jesus. Zacchaeus was shunned spiritually, shunned socially, shunned emotionally, and shunned physically. His empty hope was in a community of people just like him, outcasts, hated, people who were hated. And also he had kind of maybe an empty hope in what he could get away with taking from this world. But what kind of hope is that? Hope in people who are deceptive by nature and vocation, his buddies, his co-workers. Hope in stealing enough to do what? Maybe escape in retirement to a place where nobody knows him. Maybe he can start over. No, I wasn't there. You got me confused with somebody else. I was, I was a, a, a scribe. I don't know. I wasn't a tax collector. Ugh, no, those guys are awful. There's really no hope in his life. And it's no surprise that Zacchaeus, like so many people who were mired in hopelessness, responded to Jesus with such dramatic devotion and repentance. This is a powerful story of a journey from hopelessness to hopefulness. And maybe it's the, the power of the big change. Maybe that's why these stories are recorded for us so often in Scripture. <clears throat> and it, it fits perfectly with what Jesus said at the end of the Zacchaeus story, where he said, the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. This statement is often quoted as not only the mission of Jesus, but it's also extended to us as our mission as his followers. We too must seek and save the lost. But we have to be careful that we don't spend our time looking for the kind of lost that we're comfortable associating with. Instead of being willing to welcome all the lost, even those who make us uncomfortable. And we need to make sure and be careful that we don't look outward as a way of hiding things we need to change inward. Maybe I've forgotten what Jesus saved me from. Maybe I've become confident in my outward ministry. Or maybe I've left my deepest love. We should never look at another person and believe that that person needs Jesus more than I need Jesus. My need for Jesus is absolute. I need thee every hour as we sing. So we can learn a lot from this meeting between Zacchaeus and Jesus. And I'm going to focus on three primary applications and how they help us on our journey to hope, wherever you might be in this journey. First, when we make the effort to seek Jesus, we find him. Zacchaeus was willing to do whatever it took to see Jesus. And as we read this encounter, we see deliberate and committed actions. Zacchaeus went to where Jesus would be. When he got there and all he could see were the backs of the people in the crowd, he made the extra effort to see Jesus rather than to give up in frustration. We also have to go to where we can encounter Jesus. And we also have to be ready to make the extra effort. Second key point. Early on, Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount. That's Matthew 5 uh, to 7, chapters 5 through 7 uh, in Matthew's Gospel. So as Jesus began this remarkable sermon, he made nine statements about blessedness. And among these, in Matthew 5, verse 6, Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Zacchaeus, here in Luke 19, showed hunger and thirst by his deliberate actions. He encountered Jesus, and it's no surprise. When he came to Jesus hungry and thirsty, his hunger and thirst were satisfied. The same is true for me. The same is true for you. The same is true for anyone who comes to Jesus hungry and thirsty. Now, if we come to Jesus full of ourselves instead of hungry for him, 
or if we come to Jesus drunk on our own self-righteousness instead of thirsty for him. But if we come to Jesus hungry and thirsty for him, we will receive the lasting truth and will receive the eternal hope that Jesus brings. And now the third practical application. In Luke chapter 15, verses 3 through 7, Jesus told the parable of the lost sheep. I've already referenced that. In the story, the shepherd had a hundred sheep, and all but one sheep was saved. One sheep was lost and without hope, except in the shepherd. So the shepherd left the 99 in search of the one. There's no record in the story of delay or calculation. He left the 99 in the open country, it says in the, the NIV, maybe your translations too. He left them in the open country, and he went in search of the one. Now, Jesus phrased this in the form of a rhetorical question. That's how it's written in this version. It's the people he was targeting, the Pharisees and teachers of the law, self-righteous ones. He asked them this rhetorical question because he knew the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, who were the pious and holy experts in religion of their day, would have to agree that the shepherd did exactly the right thing. He went to find the lost sheep. And when the sheep was found, the shepherd rejoiced with his friends. Well, that's the, the right answer, the spiritual answer. But what would the world say? The world would have said to the shepherd, listen, you've still got those 99 sheep to worry about, and, and by, it's probably too late for that lost. You know, sheep, when they're away from the, the herd, they're herds, right? Packs of sheep, herds of sheep. I don't know, I'm an oil man, not an a, a animal guy, but I think it's a herd. Uh, a sheep gets away from the herd and it falls into a pit, gets eaten by a coyote or wolf or whatever they had around there in those days. It was too late for that one. It's already lost. But that's not how Jesus sees it. Jesus sees every person, every soul, to have great importance, great worth. And yes, it is true that Jesus came to provide salvation for the entire vast human race. His salvation is available to all, to everyone. But I'd say most of all, Jesus came to save each individual. Jesus came to save me. The one lost sheep. We grasp hope when we have a shepherd like that. And we see the shepherd like that. We hunger for him. We thirst for him. We seek him and we find him. So as that parable of the lost sheep ends in Luke 15... Jesus says there's rejoicing in heaven when one sinner repents. To repent means to turn around and follow Jesus. Whether it's for the first time or again, we turn away from our focus on self to focus on Jesus. And when one sinner does this, there is a celebration in the presence of God. And that's what happened when Zacchaeus repented. When Zacchaeus came to Jesus. Though like Zacchaeus though, I can't let my reputation or my self-perception get in the way. So Zacchaeus, we, we talked for a few minutes, kind of focusing on those people who were arrogant for themselves. Zacchaeus wasn't like that. <clears throat> Zacchaeus was despised. He was rejected. He had a well-deserved bad reputation, but he was still determined to see Jesus. Zacchaeus probably thought that he was just going to watch the Jesus parade. He did not have an expectation of a one-on-one -on -one encounter with Jesus. Doesn't seem like it anyway. Now, he wasn't like the woman with an issue of blood, who we talked about previously, who was determined to touch Jesus. We don't read about that determination in Zacchaeus. He didn't know what would happen when he saw this itinerant preacher who preached hope to the isolated and performed signs and wonders to the weak and sick. So as Zacchaeus ate his breakfast that morning and he looked at his to-do list for the day, he probably did not have the following items on this list. Um, climb a sycamore tree. Probably not on his to-do list. 
Give half of what I have to the poor. It's probably not on his list. Promise to repay everyone I cheated four times what I took. Probably not on his list. But when he encountered Jesus in Luke 19, Zacchaeus' life changed in these dramatic ways. Sycamore tree? Check. Give half? Check. Make restitution? Check. Double check, quadruple check. Zacchaeus was committed. And there was rejoicing as a result. In fact, this was a saving encounter with Jesus for Zacchaeus. And Jesus makes a a wonderful statement about his desire to have an encounter with us in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. There, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. And there's a similarity, I think, to the story of Zacchaeus. When Jesus said he was going to his house, Zacchaeus could have deflected the request. And he could have done so out of a a genuine concern for Jesus. He, He could have said, I'm unworthy to have you join me. And it's certainly true that Zacchaeus was not worthy to have Jesus in his home. Zacchaeus could have said no because he didn't want to hurt Jesus' reputation. This would have been a lost cause among the Pharisees for sure. They'd been thinking about how to kill Jesus for years at this point. But there were certainly many in the crowd who were undecided. And Zacchaeus could have genuinely be concerned about Jesus' reputation. But that didn't matter. When Zacchaeus got the invitation from Jesus, he hurried down the tree and he welcomed Jesus gladly. So here, in a Sunday morning auditorium class in Alabama, streaming online probably and watching later, we're probably among those people who have invited Jesus gladly. We welcome him into our house of worship and we welcome him into our own homes. We welcome Jesus into our lives. But there might be one in this room or online who even now is looking at his life and thinking that he's hopelessly beyond salvation. That's the kind of thing the enemy wants you to think. The Bible is chock full of amazing examples of changes in people's lives. Other historical accounts are readily available. Besides just the case studies that Brother Layton's put in his book and I'm bringing to you on Sunday mornings. But also, even here in a Sunday morning auditorium class, there are amazing examples of people who were in hopeless situations who turned to Jesus and found hope. And if you think about it, and I hope you think about it, if you think about it, that's the story of every Christian. Every single one of us, just like me, was hopelessly lost. I was hopelessly lost in my sin. I was dead even as I ate my bowl of frosted flakes before heading to school at Nimitz Junior High in Odessa, Texas. I came to Jesus. I died with him in baptism and rose from that watery grave a new creation. I was changed because I welcomed Jesus. And if you're dead this morning, you can live. That's Jesus' promise, not mine. Jesus' promise, and it's a promise that you can count on. It's the hope that Jesus offers. And be ready to change, because you will. Any encounter with Jesus is a life-changing event. For some, in a negative way, it's a rejection of Jesus. And that's a change for the worse. Like you remember the locals from the Gerasenes who didn't welcome Jesus but instead ran him out of town. But for those who welcome Jesus, it's the beginning of a wonderful journey of hope. And just like I mentioned last week, Jesus didn't force change on Zacchaeus. Now it's true that Jesus started it. Now, certainly he started it way back in the beginning as the agent of creation and as the Messiah, God made flesh. But in this specific story, Zacchaeus came to see the Jesus parade. When it got more personal, 
Zacchaeus welcomed Jesus, and that changed his life. And we see this pattern often enough. An effort made, an effort recognized, and a life changed. Jesus didn't force change on Zacchaeus. He doesn't force change on us. Instead, he warmly and lovingly invites all who labor and are heavy laden to come to him for rest, to exchange the heavy burden of our sin for his easy and light burden, to rest in his gentle and humble presence. That's Matthew eleven twenty eight through 30, paraphrased. And Brother Layton picked that passage because Matthew was also a tax collector who found hope in Jesus. Those words from Jesus meant so much to Matthew and to Zacchaeus and even today to us. In Luke 19, the people around Jesus knew who and what Zacchaeus was. Some of them grumbled that Jesus would associate with him the sinful tax collector. But the crowd's opinion didn't stop Zacchaeus. He was ready and willing to change, and that was rewarded when Zacchaeus went out on a limb for Jesus. So as we close the class this morning, think about the conversations that might have taken place as Zacchaeus spent the day with Jesus and his disciples. The Bible only records what happened before they got to the house. So this is pure speculation, okay? Just my opinion and Brother Layton's opinion too. I reckon that Jesus had the lead, but I also don't think Jesus would have been the only person allowed to speak. Maybe Jesus could have had his mouth full of some delicious food or something. Zacchaeus asked a question maybe about being a disciple, what it was like or something. I don't know. Maybe Peter would have answered a question so Jesus wouldn't have had to talk with his mouth full. I don't know. We don't know. But Brother Layton brings up in his book, that a conversation between Zacchaeus and Matthew would have been great to hear if it happened. Maybe the two tax collectors shared stories about their past, talked about how to justly collect taxes, or how to change from being a tax collector to a follower, or maybe how to join a group of people in Jericho who loved Jesus, but who didn't go around following him all the time. Kind of like the man from last week who was the Gerasene missionary. Maybe that day was the start of a new life for Zacchaeus, telling the story of Jesus who called him down from the sycamore tree and spent the day at his house. Do you think that story, that is Zacchaeus' story, of a journey from hopelessness to hopefulness would have been inspiring? Maybe you can find a way to use your own challenging life situations to help others find hope. What story are you going to tell? Will you tell about your encounter with Jesus as you see others who need to hear about him for the first time? Or to encourage those who, after encountering him, still hunger and thirst to hear the old, old story of Jesus and his love? Zacchaeus changed his life when he sought out Jesus. And then Jesus changed Zacchaeus' life when Zacchaeus responded to Jesus' call to spend the day with them. The encounter with Jesus brought salvation to Zacchaeus and his household. He was a lost sheep, a lost coin. Indeed, he was a lost son, and Jesus, as Jesus said of him in Luke 19, 9. Zacchaeus went from empty, isolated, and hopeless, dead, to life, salvation, and hopefulness. If Zacchaeus were here today, if we were going to sing at the cross... How would Zacchaeus sing verse 5 about giving himself away? <clears throat> the verse says, But drops of grief can never repay the debt of love I owe. Here, Lord, I give myself away. It's all that I can do. Would he sing, Here, Lord, I give half of my goods away? Would he sing, Here, Lord, I give four times as much as I stole away? Or would he sing, like we do, Here, Lord, I give myself away? Or would he be able to sing at all? Some hymns choke me up and I can't get through them. This probably happens to you sometimes. That's what I hope for y'all. I hope for you to be overwhelmed by the hope that you have in Jesus. Overwhelmed by the power of hope sparked, hope sensed, and hope seen in Jesus. And I also hope to see you here next week.